And now, the survival show that once survived getting married to the same woman three different times in three different languages. In this episode, we sit down with James of Survival Punk. He's going to share with us the benefits of life in a tiny house, the upsides, the downsides, the pitfalls, and even dating. Howdy, and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 196. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole, safe and sound. James, welcome to In the Rabbit Hole, dude. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Yeah, now, I have actually professionally and been aware of you for a long time. I don't listen to your show. And as we were just talking about, you know, it's it's a lot of us try not to listen to each other's shows so that we don't accidentally, like, repeat someone else's material or get, get to sounding too much like somebody else. So I am excited because it's like hanging out with a brother. I get to somebody else to commiserate with, which we did a little bit of the pain and torture that is making a podcast and also the the fun and excitement of making a podcast. So it's fun to actually get a chance to talk to you today. And we're even, we've even got something to argue about, which is going to be even, even better. I love a good argument and a rambling, a rambling argument is the best. Yes. Yes. It's a little early for dancing girls and booze, but I think this may call for it. But uh, all that aside, so we're going to talk about tiny houses today, and I sort of understand how tiny houses and largely don't get tiny houses. So aside from the survival benefits, let's start there. Convince us why are tiny houses cool? Do you like being in debt? No, not really. My home is paid for. <laughs> I've always I've always had like a severe aversion to like debt owing money. I just just never clicked in my head right. Like even before I went down the survival path, I remember being in college and having some student loans and I'm like, well, I can never pay back four thousand dollars. That's a ridiculous amount of money. I'm dropping out. I'm done. You know, and then work two jobs so I can pay off that four thousand dollars, you know, that was nothing for for one year. So a lot of people that age, you know, they're tacked with a hundred thousand dollars in you know underwater basket weaving, and they'll never pay that <laughs> off. Uh, so you know, I've just always had this aversion to it. So I actually became a member of the tiny house community before I even even heard of it. I've I've lived in some unusual places. I was homeless when I was younger, so you know you kind of couch surf around, which part of my punk culture there too. Mm-hmm. So and I remember at one point. Ooh, probably around 24 or so, I bought this like, so what was it? Lowe's, Lowe's had a sell on this like shed because it was a shed kit and the subfloor was rotted. Everything else was fine. And they marked it down to like, I don't know, $200 for, for two eight by 10 sheds. So I bought them both. I built them, you know, and I put uh, like a couch and some library books in one, you know, a bedroom and entertainment center stuff in the other. You know, I lived in those two uh, eight by ten sheds for a couple of months, and this is this is like two thousand five or so, mm. way before I'd heard about the movement. I don't need a lot of space, and you know, I was happy. You know, it was so it was on my friend's land. So for showers, I just went next door. You know, I can go next door and cook. I just need a place. I mean, for the most part, most people just kind of sleep in their house. Mm. You know, especially a bedroom. Like you go in your bedroom, you go to sleep. Why do you need? a giant bedroom or why do you need a guest room that has one person in it? Like once a year, I always just slept on people's couches. I don't need a guest room. I have a couch. So, okay. So you'll see like posts on Facebook and stuff. There's like, I built my tiny house for like $3 and 98 cents. No, you didn't stop lying. (laughs) Yeah. Unless you you have a wiki up. Yeah. You know, and, and even, you know, when, when I was making my decision to go semi off grid, for a project that didn't work out, you know, I was looking at like every sort of, every sort of like housing option. Cause I wanted to, I wanted to build a house and be debt free for the rest of my life, which allowed me to funnel that money into steaks. I like steak a lot. So, <laughs> you know, and I looked at things like uh yurts and even like a lot of the yurt kits were a few thousand dollars. Yeah. For, they're pretty for, expensive. Exactly. You know, like it's, it's canvas walls, it, really a, a couple thousand dollars. And I was like, no, so I looked into all the tiny house options and some of them, 
some of them get a little crazy. I'm not going to lie. Like yeah. you, you can go look at some of these pre-built tiny houses and you'll find, you know, find prices in forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for a finished 10, you know, a hundred square foot house. No. Yeah. At that point, <laughs> no. go buy an Airstream. Yes. So, so sort of my tiny house for survival philosophy is basically anything that's not a standard site built house generally. Mm -hmm. Uh, so converted sheds, tiny house on wheels, you know, RVs, airstreams, yurts. So you're actually including RVs and other things like that into the concept of tiny houses. You're not exclusively like the tiny house TV show where people build, like you were saying, the forty and hundred thousand dollar hundred square foot house put on a frame <laughs> that wasn't designed yeah. to handle that kind of weight and that shape. Yeah. So anything that's not a standard house, a standard thousand square foot house or whatever, basically I'm considering a tiny house because it's your house is where you live, your home. And if it's below, I think the general acceptable threshold is like 400 square feet, which is, you know, a tiny mansion, you know, 400 square feet, mm. which is what Jay Schaefer, sort of one of the pioneers in the movement uh, that sells his designs. Like he now lives in like a 400 square foot house because he got married and had a baby and his wife is like, I need more room. Mm -hmm. So he made more room, <laughs> you know, anything, anything around that 400 square foot. Mine, my home, which is a converted shed, basically it got cheap that I bought a shed frame from an Amish builder for three grand. And mm -hmm. it's a 12 by 20, you know, which is, it works out to being a little over 200 square feet with the, the loft because the loft is over the entire living room area. Mm -hmm. So it's pro no, it's not not probably. It definitely is like eight by twelve because I use eight foot long uh, two by sixes <laughs> to run along it. So you know, it's all of that storage up. You know, that's where I keep my spare bug out bag and a lot of extra survival gear, blankets, my uh, queen size mattresses up there. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's enough room for me. Uh, and when my girlfriend visits, it's just enough room for both of us. It's cozy and small and. I even have a lot of stuff like I I go through and purge my stuff a lot, but I have three full bookcases, you know, and the podcast studio and all the other stuff that I have. You brought up a, a good point here when your girlfriend comes over. So dating in a tiny house, what's that like? Like, is that a thing like girls, come, not like a thing, a thing, but like girls come over and you're like, hey, come on over to my tiny house. Is that an awkward conversation at first? Because it's, well, it's not an apartment, so it is unusual. So there might be resistance to it. How does that, how does that work as a, a young swinging bachelor? I've never had a problem. Like I, so I've had my tiny house for three years and I've had my girlfriend, well, going on three years. I, every girl I've ever mentioned, uh, and I think I, I dated, I went on dates with like, two or three girls before I started dating my girlfriend, the general reaction is, oh, you live in a tiny house. That's awesome. There's always follow-up questions like, well, how do you pee? How do you do this? <laughs> you know, but generally, generally like the eyes light up and they're like, oh, that's really cool. Cause most girls know what the tiny house movement is. It's, it's on TV and people know about it. And anyone that I've shown pictures to and talked to about, it, you know, like at work and strangers that I meet, I've never heard, James, you're freaking weird. That's crazy. It's not for everybody, but I love it. Mm -hmm. So does the questions ever come up? Because there is a, a pretty quick point <laughs> where, where women come over to a young guy's house and they immediately do a couple of things. They say, well, you know, if uh, I, I've noticed this trend uh, that a few things go through their mind. The first one is, how would I redecorate this? And uh, the next one is like, are we going to stay here if things progress to the point of marriage? And, uh, man, girls are like 20 steps ahead. Guys are just like, what's for dinner? So yeah. in that sense, have, has there been any kind of questions that come up for you? I mean, you've, so you've been in this house about the same amount of time you've been dating, uh, this, this woman. Is that, that's correct? That's what I just got out of this? Uh, close. Yeah, close. So in that time, has it come up like, well, if things progress and we get serious, we're, you know, are we going to stay living in a tiny house? What's, what's that conversation like? Or has it even come up? Oh, that's, that's a contention. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to think that this will become my man cave. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will have to probably do like Jay Schaefer and get a larger tiny house. Yeah, it, <laughs> she doesn't, it, well, 
if it was just me and her, it would probably be sweet and it wouldn't be an issue. Mm-hmm. Cause well, except for closet, you know, yeah. <laughs> yes. I I'd have to, I'd have to put it in a whole nother tiny house just for closet space. Mm-hmm. But, uh, in my case, my girlfriend has a son. So, you know, with the loft and stuff, there's no like separation of a room. So uh, we'd have to get an extra room. Yeah. What I like to think is a lot like of the original pioneers, you know, you, you build your tiny house on your land cause you buy your land then you can't really afford to get a house. So then you, you build your tiny house for as cheap as you can. I stayed under probably under nine grand and I've been in it for three years. I still got some trim work to do, but nine grand debt free. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. That's not you bad. Know? Yeah. And then now that you, you are debt free, you have a lot of possibility to save money that you could be saving to build a bigger house or do a lot of these survival projects that you're like, I'd love to do that, but I don't have money. Yeah. So is your intention to have this tiny house, live in this tiny house, and then I are you saving up to go and go get land? For them? Just $3 a month? Are you serious? Listeners, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? Well, you should see what kind of love we give the Roving Horde Armada members. Check it out today by going to itrh.net. You may be wondering what the Armada members get for their hard-earned money. How about access to every episode ever produced by In the Rabbit Hole? You might be wondering, how many episodes is that? Really? How many? How many could it possibly be? Well, that's about 170 hours of long, deep conversations on preparedness. Can you dig it? You'll receive an invitation to the secret ITRH Armada Facebook group. Did you hear me? Secret. That means you don't know about it. I don't know about it. Nobody knows about it. So you can chat about the sweet, sweet survival all night long, baby. And you know how much fun that is. Get a free copy of the book, Owning Your Survival. You'll put that preparedness thing under your spell. Go to ITRH.net because you know what Nelly says, it's getting hot in here. Access the famous ITRH Bob and Emergency Kit on Demand class. You know what to do with that bag, that perfect bag. You put it on her back. Oh yeah, that's nice right there, baby. You know how I like it. Ammo spreadsheets. Put your bullets in there, big boy. You know how to do it. Shh, shh. Enough said. Monthly in-person and virtual online meetups. We've got to get together, honey badger. Ooh wee. And that's just a little taste. You like that, don't you? You dirty, dirty boy. Go deeper down the rabbit hole and show that bunny some love. Visit itrh.net to help keep the show safe and sound. That keeps you safe and sound. Now back to you, big boy Aaron. So is your intention to have this tiny house, live in this tiny house, and then I are you saving up to though and go get land to then build a bigger tiny house or or just build something bigger in general? What what's your your kind of plan there? Or do you have one? I have a plan. So my best friend and the co-host of the podcast that I'm on, he owns 27 acres. So I'll just put my house on his, you know, 27 mm-hmm. acres, can't go wrong. So in the future, I really like building and uh, you know, the sort of the the reason that I started Survival Punk was because I love DIY and I love to to build and make and figure things out. So in the future, what I want to do is try using different building techniques to build different structures and maybe eventually end up on something that, you know, really hits home that I love and try that. Like I really want to build one of Paul Wheaton's uh, Wafati type buildings. It looks like it's perfect with the uh, the solar gain and the uh, the inertia thing that he has with it. Where I don't like heating really. With a tiny house, heating is fairly easy. And the same thing with cooling. But with that, basically your temperature year round is about perfect. I like that. So my real plan is to try lots of different sort of off grid building techniques, throw everything at the wall, see what sticks, and and go with it. With the transportation of these tiny houses and a lot, I, I haven't watched a lot of the episodes, but I I've watched a few just out of curiosity. There always seems to be some sort of issue with the frame and the mobile frame 
that is put on these homes and everything else. And having uh, a background in architecture and construction management and everything like that, I look at it and go, yeah, you can't put that kind of weight on a frame like that and expect, you know, not to blow out tires and things like that. So is that more TV show drama or is that a very typical thing that people build houses, these tiny houses on frames and it's, they've built something too big or too heavy uh, because of finishes and just general crap they've stuffed the tiny house with what, where does that end up? Because that always seems to me as a, a kind of a big drawback and a big issue for tiny houses. I, you know what? I think a lot of that is TV drama because uh, I've not come across, you know, on forums and other blogs and stuff. I haven't came across a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, I tried moving my house and I blew out tires. And I think a lot of that besides TV drama comes from. So the tiny house movement attracts a lot of people that have never built anything and have no comprehension of building at all. And they slap everything on there, you know, and so they try to drive with built houses on trailers loaded down, which is probably not the best idea ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like because uh, you got to think, though, a lot of these trailers are getting I've seen videos where people get I, I saw one video where a guy took a a small like 20 foot long uh, mobile home and then built his tiny house on this because he bought like. He got, a, I think, a free trailer because it had burned down, but all he wanted was, you know, the trailer frame off of it. So he got that and then, you know, built on it. So he got a free trailer, basically, which obviously was built to hold a mobile home. So he's building a tiny house, easily fit. And I think he cut it down so it wasn't even as long. Okay. Or, like, people will get, like, burnt and messed up Airstreams and they'll build on those. So these frames were a lot of times designed to hold the weight that you know you're putting on. You know, it was either a trailer or, you know, an airstream, which was a mobile, you know, house dwelling. Yeah. So in those cases, there is good. And then sometimes they'll overbuild them or they will load their houses up to capacity with all their possessions and then try to drive with it. And that's oh, God. that's if you pot. So yeah. I built mine not on a uh, trailer. Mine's, like I said, a converted shed, basically. And I have had to move it, which is what I love about uh, the tiny houses. Because basically, and, and I joked about it in an article I wrote, I called it a bug out tiny house or a booth. Yeah, a booth. Because <laughs> we love acronyms, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I had originally built my house on a piece of land with a friend of mine. And we were trying this like sort of survival project. It didn't work out so well. Uh, we had our disagreements, and I hired a shed moving company to come pick up my house and move it. I didn't know there yeah. was such a thing. Yeah, I mean, the people that deliver sheds. That makes sense, this, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The only thing is, like like I was saying, I had to rent a U-Haul and empty out my house, so it was just an empty shed. You know, It was an empty dwelling. Because, well, one, it would slosh around and break stuff. But that extra added weight, you know, that's extra toll on the trailer that's moving your home. So, yeah, I, you see these people and they're driving around with fully loaded homes. And that always was like, I don't think you should do that. I mean, not even for like, they're like, oh, we have everything battened down and it won't fall out. And I'm like, you're asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would rather empty it out, you know, and it's, it's a tiny house. Really, how much are you emptying? And then, you know, in an emergency, you know, like. I, you could, I guess, if you like really batten down the hatches, but then gas and then tires. I wouldn't recommend moving your tiny house with your possessions in it. It just seems like asking for trouble. Yeah. So as far as I get, I get where you're coming from since you enjoy DIY projects and things like that. Uh, but it seems like a lot of people that get involved with the tiny home movement are just interested in purging their lifestyle and as a way of doing that, constricting the amount of square face they have, uh, they have to deal with. And I guess the part that I don't understand is why build something when there's already a huge industry out there for RVs that are already made, already ready to whether new or used and just drive off the lot. And we'll leave the airstreams of the world to the side since those really are sort of the, the Taj Mahal's of, RVs and can be ridiculously expensive. I know at one point my wife and I were looking at like the Airstream Bambi for, but it was like $30,000. And I was like, yeah, no, 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 that, no, that, that idea is not working out. No. So why, I mean, exclu excluding that, why, why not just buy like pre-built RV or something? 
one of the things I like most about tiny houses is, well, since they are small, you can spend more money on getting quality in your home instead of, you know, like a lot of these, like you can go probably get a used uh, fifth wheel or RV for $2,000, $5,000, you know? Uh-huh. But you're getting a lot of the same problems you get with a mobile home. It's cheaper, substandard stuff. It, it may look okay. It may look good. But it's not really what I want to live in in a home, you know. It's okay for like, oh, I'm going to be like Gary Collins. You know, he lives in one while he's building his uh, tiny house up on the mountain. It's bigger than a tiny house, but yeah. it's still fairly small square footage. It's not really what I want in a long-term thing. Like tiny house, you have tinier stuff. So like if you want to do – tile marble tile in your bathroom you know in in a normal bathroom that's going to cost thousands of dollars in a tiny house bathroom you could do that for maybe a couple hundred dollars or a hundred mm-hmm. you know so you're able to buy better quality better built materials because you're using less of it you know that it's going to be solid safe you know if you're qualified to be building a home in the first place <laughs> or you hire a subcontractor mm-hmm. You're going to overbuild things. And I'm pretty sure, you know, most of us in the survival industry, we like, we like things that are built rugged, built tough, built to last. Was that a Ford commercial? I think so. (laughs) I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Ford, the tiny house company. Yeah. (laughs) That's, that's what I like. I like, I like having quality and durability. So, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'd much rather have a nice floor, a nice walls over, you know, the, have you seen like the, the little thin, like old 1970s paneling in those things? Like mm-hmm. the stuff your granddad had in his like his den. Yeah. Yeah. I No. So yeah, my house, like, you know, I was able to custom pick the walls and I'm just not a fan of drywall. So I got sheets of plywood, thick, sturdy plywood, uh, I think three eighths inch and I stained it. So it's all stained, sanded plywood. So I can see the wood grain everywhere. I think it looks pretty. Uh, the kitchen is painted red and the wood grain shines through it. You're able to like get quality and get what you really want. Like instead of being like, well, that's close enough to what I want. So we'll just go ahead and well, we'll just deal with it. How do you, I guess, what's the process for making sure that you don't overbuild something to the point where it is unreasonable to try to move it later? Because in a lot of instances, and I guess there's a case to be made for building a tiny house on, say, kind of uh, hunting property or country property or something like that, where you're you're like, you know what, I, I'm not going to move this thing. But a lot of them are appealing to people because of that they are pseudo mobile. How do you account for that? Like, how do you make sure, in a in a nutshell, without lots of math, how do you make sure that what you're building could actually get on the road? You hire a contractor that knows what they're doing. Mm. And unless you personally have those skills, you should hire a contractor or at least consult with one or a tiny house professional with a good reputation. There's a Tennessee tiny house builders it's around the Memphis area. They do that professionally. They do great videos on them. They build them on the trailers to drive around. And I think I price checked them and they were, they were actually reasonable. I was like, those are about the best prices I've seen, uh, in like the 12 to 15 range for a hundred foot or mm-hmm. hundred square foot, which it delivered. So they'll deliver it for that price. But you know, they're in that business. They're going to, they're going to consult general building practices. They know that it's going to ride on that trailer. If you're just going to wing it, I wouldn't. I would say that the better option would be for someone that's going to, if you're going to, and legality, I don't know the laws in your area. If you're going to build like a shed that's going to be on bricks of some sort, it's a little bit easier because you you don't have to worry about it moving. Mm. And even mine, mine did move, but mine was built sturdy. The uh, the plywood walls hold everything together. I don't want to ever move my house again, though. So when I got it, we checked, we checked everything was still square and level. The door still open and stuff. None of the, uh, the plaster that I put in between the gaps was cracked or anything, but you know, it, and that, that's a downside. Like, yeah, people want to build their own houses, but without any skills, you're going to have to go the same route as building a normal size home, just smaller and better quality. You, you're going to still have to get a contractor. I'm not big on the ones that move just because there's so many headaches. Like if you're die hard set on that, 
there are options to buy them. Like you said, there are there are cheap RVs. You could get the, the cheapest one you can find and just remodel it. So gut it and put better quality stuff in there. And then you know, generally it was it was built to ride. You just happen to change the flooring and the walls, you know, and some of the appliances, it'll still be good to roll. You're not altering the frame of that. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, yeah, I suggest you get a contract that knows what they're doing and consult with them. You brought up a, an interesting thing. Since you just said appliances. When you were putting them in your tiny house or when other people in the forums you've been to and things like that, when they're doing it, do they just use appliances typically intended for an RV or do they go out and buy the appliances that were meant for like a garage apartment or efficiency or something like that that tend to be much smaller? Or do they put full-size stuff in? In my case, I went with the biggest mini fridge I can get my hands on, which is generally about enough. Mm. You want to really tailor it to what your needs are. So I have a pantry because I'm a prepper. I like lots of room to store food. Yeah. You know, and food storage was part of my design. I want to make sure that I have a big kitchen with lots of room for, you know, rice and beans and whatnot. And my pantry was built just big enough to hold my deep freezer. So all of my meat and extra stuff is in there. So small fridge, big deep freezer, you know, so I can rotate out. sort of the fresh food in the, in the fridge and then the deep freezer can hold all the long term and the, most of the freezables that won't go in the ridiculously tiny, useless freezer for the rest of the appliances you kind of either have electric or propane. I mean, that's, that's as a tiny house, those are your two real options. And I've got a, one of those Coleman, uh, stove tops that uses the little Coleman canisters. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really good. Except for my local stores were out of the canisters a lot. So I kind of have that on reserve for emergencies. Just, I got tired of trying to find it. And then when it was out, I'm like, well, how do I cook my bacon and eggs without fuel? Mm. It was a pain in the butt. So now I use, I don't even have a, an oven. I just don't use one. I do 100% of my cooking really on an induction cooktop that just plugs into my counter. Just yeah, plugs those into are pretty the neat. Yeah. And uh, it's great if I need it, if I need to go to, you know, two burners. I just have a, just a really cheap, like, Goodwill store, just cooktop. Just, you know, same as your normal cooktop. Mm-hmm. The induction thing I have, it, it has this weird cycling thing where like it's amazing for boiling water. Like you boil water for for your coffee and then you walk off and come back and it's boiling. But when you're cooking some food, like because of it cycles on and off, it I don't know, it's it gets on my nerves sometimes. I'd rather just be on all the time and cook. I didn't know they did that. You know, and that brings up another point you were talking about a second ago about storage. I guess that was part of your initial design that you planned for storing lots of food. What what went into that thought process? And and how did you, I, I guess, and that also leads into the bigger question of just how do you account for storage, period, in a tiny house? Vertical space. Vertical space is your savior. So I have, like I said earlier, my loft is fairly large, you know, covering an 8 by 12 area uh, atop of the living room. So on the sides beside the bed, I have storage for tools and survival equipment. And there's some some of my long-term uh, – I haven't broke up my long-term camping food. You know, my Mountain House meals, my mm -hmm. MREs, Field Strip, they're up there as well with my survival gear. And uh, my pantry, which is fairly large for – the you know, if you consider the total square footage of the house, the pantry is fairly large for it. And it has multiple shelves and the deep freezer. And, you know, it's it goes all the way up basically until the ceiling. And the ceiling is, you know, I'm six foot. I can't jump and touch it. Uh, it's a fairly large ceiling. Mm. So it goes all the way up, you know, and there's rice up there and whatnot. And then uh, on the shelves, they're probably three feet long, three feet deep. And I have them packed all the way back. And then that's just there. Like, you know. Like I said, I have three bookshelves and most bookshelves, like there's always that space behind the books. So mm -hmm. you could store a lot of food there. I store on top of the, the bookshelves. And 
if you don't have so much clutter, like if you go through and you're like, well, oh, I haven't used that in five years. I haven't used that in a year. And like, I never wear those. Like you just sort of like get rid of the junk that you're storing that you don't need and prioritize it for things that you do need. People have a lot of, lot of junk and they're like, well, I can't possibly get rid of that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You mm-hmm. won't, you won't even miss it. Yeah. I think when, when my wife and I moved into this house, I'd had my last house for, I think right at about 18 years. And I filled up a wow. dumpster. I think I want to say I filled up a bun- dumpster about three quarters of the way. And it was just like all this stuff that, you know, it would just get packed away over the years. Cause it's easy if you've got the space, you know, it's like, well, I'll just, I'll just stuff this shit over here and I don't yeah. want to get, you know, for whatever reason you're like, I don't want to get rid of it. But it's funny when you're, you know, moving and you're like, well, I don't want to pay movers to move that or I don't want to deal that or why the hell do I still have that? And it's like uh, in the dumpster you go, or then there was always the, since at that time we lived on a busy street, it would just put stuff out on the curb and in five minutes, yeah. someone else was, was using it. And, uh, or, you know, you'd see some homeless guy using it as a hat walking down the street, which was quite entertaining. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I could see that part, but do you ever find limitations where you're just like, ah, oh, crap, I, you know, if I had a little bit more space, I could, I don't know, have a mountain bike or, or something like that. I, I'm just using something stupid, but uh, you get where I'm going. Do you, do you feel the crunch at all of, of having that little space to work with? I, I don't. Uh, I've, I've, I can't think of a single time where I'm like, okay. So the only things I could ever think of that that annoy me, like, so I want to put in a a wood stove, which, which is really actually hard because I can't just go get like one of the the Home Depot cheap jobs because it's too much heat. Like it, there, there's not enough. Like I'd have to insulate the entire thing in like concrete just to even have it not like melt my house down, <laughs> you know, and then getting it so far away from the walls. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I have a space in here that can even remotely like, I, you know, it's like there's an outlet there and there's a wall there. And like, I can't. So, and I'm trying to look for a tiny wood stove that's affordable. Cause you would think, you would think that the smaller you got on a wood stove, the cheaper it'd get, which is, not true at all. Yeah, it's kind of like appliances. I'm sure it actually works in the inverse. It does. Uh, some of the so the best tiny house, tiny house wood stove is the Kimberly, which is like four grand, and Whoa. it has like it has zero clearance. Like you you don't need to insulate it or anything. Like you can plop it anywhere. It won't catch the walls on fire. It has a giant window in the front to see the fire burn. Four grand. I'm like I. That'll never happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's good to look at and admire, but it'll never happen. And I'm a guy. And like most like most men, I'm kind of messy. So if I don't keep on the clutter, you know, like I have half finished projects here and, you know, survival knives and a chisel I'm sharpening. And if I don't stay on it, it gets cluttered really fast because there's there's no room in here. And then you're like, damn it, I need more space. Like, I'm just like. Only when it gets cluttered and, you know, before I clean, that's when it annoys me. It's like I don't have enough room to be messy, (laughs) which, you know, which give or take, like, that's not the worst thing in the world. Like, it (laughs) prompts me to clean a little more. I'm sure your girlfriend appreciates that. (sighs) Yeah, yeah. She. So, you you know, and you brought up heating and cooling with woods. How do you heat? your place since since the wood stove is kind of uh, a, a bag of bees for you well it's fairly easy you know my house has good solar gain it's south facing i have big windows on the south side my curtains you know are black they absorb a lot of the heat and let them flow into the room and i live in tennessee so the weather's not that terrible like we don't mm-hmm. usually get super cold except for the first winter i moved in we had like one day that was like negative two, we had, uh, I think seven days. Like I drove home from work one night and we had, we had a, like snow was falling. We had a seven day ice storm. I was trapped in my house for seven days. Couldn't get out. And before I got home, I filled up my, my kerosene, uh, NATO can that I carry. And that NATO can filled with, what is it? Like two and a half gallons or something, three, maybe three gallons, 
whatever goes in the NATO can. That lasted me the entire seven days in a tiny kerosene heater. So that's that's when I was using kerosene. Uh, this past year, I bought a little uh, Mr. Buddy heater, the big 15-pound propane tank. And on the low setting, which keeps it really nice for myself, I can run that thing, I think I figured, for 15 days straight if hmm. I was to run it all day and all night. Uh, and I usually only run it for a few hours at a time. You know, I warm it up to about 65, 70 in here and then let it coast for a few hours. And while I'm asleep, I like it frigid freezing. So I turn off all the heat when I sleep, wake up, turn it back on. You know, and if I have the kerosene heater, which I have a different kerosene here now, a bigger one, and it gets too hot in here. If I leave it on for about an hour, the house gets to about 75. And then I just have to, and that's like, that's forcing the knob to go lower than it's supposed to go. It's like, keep going lower. Keep it. <laughs> if I ran it at full blast, it would it would be a sauna in here and I'd be miserable. Mm. So 15 days with that little Mr. Buddy heater, that's – think about the redundancy you'd have if you had just a few of those canisters or even if you had like a propane pig outside and just ran, you know, plumbed up to it. You'd have a year's worth of heat. You could spend the four grand or even a few hundred dollars because they have cheaper, not four thousand dollar tiny house wood stoves. I've seen some in the four hundred to a thousand dollar range that are small enough to actually work in a tiny house, you know. And then you have the extra, the extra level of you know self sufficiency there. I'm happy with just the Mister the Mister Buddy Burner. Mm -hmm. So what about cooling? I've got the smallest air conditioner you can get from Walmart. And I actually got it for free because it was laying out in my buddy's shed. So I'm like, hey, can I have this? Yes, you can. Nice. Yeah. And before that, so I went the first maybe two summers without AC and I just ran fans. I had a whole house window fan that I just put in the window and ran constantly. And then when I slept, I basically surrounded myself with three fans to blow on me at all times, mm -hmm. which it wasn't the worst thing in the world. I lived, I survived, but man, I love having the AC and maybe 10 inches across or something, this air conditioner. Oh, wow. I've never and seen it, one that small. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's like at Walmart during the summertime, you can get it for like, like a hundred bucks or something. Hmm. And it keeps my house perfect. And you know, it's so small, it barely hits your electric bill. Huh? That's yeah. pretty impressive. Right. And just the fans, though, just the, like if if there was a collapse or a power outage, I could run just the, the whole house window fan on nothing. I have a uh, battery backup system that I built that'll run that that'll run my fridge. I can drive up to my window and hook my car up to recharge it. Oh, cool. So speaking of power, do you use solar at all? I don't. Not yet. I'm hooked up to the grid, so I want to incorporate in solar. That's just further down the list of projects to do. So how, how come money, money? I just don't have the money yet. Yeah. Solar. I think solar is a lot more expensive than most people realize. And then all of a sudden you get into it and you're like, holy crap, this is actually a very expensive, uh, proposition. Yeah. Yeah. It's hopefully like Tesla or someone develops like a really legit technology that'll make it affordable. It's even subsidized and it's still too expensive. So until it gets more reasonable, it's not my budget. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do you or, or other people in into these tiny houses, what kind of zoning and legal issues do they bring up? Like, are there instances where people buy land and then go put their tiny house on it and then some blue hair complains about it and it causes problems? How big of a deal does that become? For some people, depending on where you're at and your area, it can be a pretty big deal. A lot of the tiny houses that are built on wheels, they kind of skirt around the zoning laws and the building codes, which, you know, anytime you can like give a middle finger to the government, I love that. Absolutely. So, yeah, because they're on wheels, they kind of fall under like RV things where you don't have to have it zoned or coded. Some places, some places, and I hate this, they realize that. So they started passing laws to get at them anyway, which really makes me angry. Like, government's like, I, we can't tax this. We need to find out a way to tax this. So they write a code. I hate it. Really, I wouldn't suggest people 
try building their tiny house on wheels or just throw it on, you know, like a rebuilt shed on the ground. I wouldn't suggest doing that. Like if you have an HSA, you're not going to get by with it, mm-hmm. whether it's on wheels or not, they're going to find a way to get you. And if you drive through a lot of these country back roads, like around where I'm at, you find people living in all sorts of ramshackle shacks. And you <laughs> yeah. like, if you see that, you're like, oh, this is probably the place I should build. You know, like there's, there's like travel trailers with like the wheels chopped off and like uh, tarps over them for roofs. And you're like, okay, so they're probably pretty lenient out here. <laughs> mm-hmm. if, you know, if you find manicured lawns and stuff and picket fences, probably not the best place. And, uh, you know, I, I don't I, I suggest people probably should look into the local laws and and see what they are and, you know, make that decision whether you want to try it and be one of the people that are on Facebook. It's like this man can't live off grid like Gary, Gary Collins. He's actually got codes and a building permit and he's following all the rules. Maybe you don't want to follow the rules, you know, and that's that's the decision that you have to make for yourself. You know, where you where you want to make your fight and where you want to lay low and not not make your fight well interesting stuff man i'm still not sold on it but i mean you know it's it's not for everybody and i I think that's the thing though is it's not for everybody but for people who are interested and I, i actually do have a friend who has uh i believe she's now she had a house and i think she's now like you put it on corporate lease and she got a uh a travel trailer and has remodeled it and is now traveling around and doing all that kind of fun stuff so because I know when I was uh, single, there was a, a period where I was convinced I was going to sell my house and move on to a sailboat. Um, I think yeah. I also thought maybe I was going to, you know, grow a mustache and drive a Ferrari and be Magnum PI or something. But at the time, it seemed like a brilliant idea. But I definitely do get the the appeal of having a confined space and and trying to do things to lower your bills and all that fun stuff. So, well, cool. So, James, how do people keep up with you? How do people get in touch with you. You are, we've hinted at it a few times here. You, you are the survival punk. So tell us about that. I run the survival punk blog. Basically, you know, years ago, my friends were kind of sick of me, like telling me about these projects I was doing and, you know, all these things I was working on. So I was like, I'll just make a website and maybe like three people will go read it. And, <laughs> yeah. and I'll just be able to like write down my, you know, like little DIY projects that I'm working on and, and, you know, rantings and whatnot. So, after the long struggle of trying to find the perfect domain name, I was like, well, I'll just combine everything I love, which is sort of survival and uh, some paleo and some fitness stuff and some punk music, you know, and everything with the punk attitude of just the DIY ethic. And, you know, like I don't I don't need permission and I don't need uh, anything. I'm just going to go do it my way, put it out there, eh, we'll see what people think. Mm-hmm. So that's what survivalpunk.com. It grew from that. Awesome. And it's still there somehow. I don't. I don't know why. <laughs> so it's a blog and a podcast. It's it started out as a as a blog. I still blog there. Right now, I'm working on five posts a week. Nice. And then every Wednesday, mm-hmm. I've been on schedule for a while. We put out a podcast. Me and my co-host, which has been described by some as the most electrifying podcast on survival entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> which that's sort of my kick. Like, uh, it's, it's sort of a raunchy comedy yet. You'll learn stuff and you'll laugh. Who really wants to be bored? <laughs> Have you listened to a podcast and like the guys like Ben Stein, he's like, today we are going to learn yes. about survival. And yes. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't. Uh, I mean, there's some, you know, and I have a YouTube channel and, and I was watching, I was watching a guy recently on YouTube and whatever he was talking about or making, I'm like, this is the best. But he was so boring. I was like, ah, just, you know what? It was it was the Hacksmith channel. I mean, he has a billion people. But he was just talking so boring. And, I, you know, you can see that people get passionate. Like, this guy basically built crutches with rockets on him and tried to shoot himself in the <laughs> air to fly like Iron Man. You know, and and he was like, yeah, I got it. You know, and then he was excited. But when he was talking about other stuff, it's like, and we burned up all these motors. And I'm like, oh, come on, just be passionate. <laughs> so you're not. Your stuff is exciting, and and you did mention raunchy, just so that if that turns certain people off, they should uh, just to be fair warning for them. Yes, I <laughs> I did. Uh, yeah, I I do cuss. 
I do an adult show for adults. Like mm-hmm. I'm not saying that kids may not find value in my shows, but it's not it's not my audience. I'm not aiming for kids. I want people that won't be offended by an F bomb mm-hmm. or any words. If you're offended easily by anything, my show is not the show for you. <laughs> it, I'm, awesome, I don't dude. feel that your audience will be easily offended. I don't think um, so. If, if they're still listening to me after this much time, then I, I think they should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome, dude. So tell us the website address survivalpunk.com. Awesome. Punk like punk music. Yes, P-U-N-K. Sir. Well, dude, James, it's good to talk to you. It's good to have you on the show. Uh, I think this has, been a, this has been a fun show. I, like I said, I don't, tiny houses aren't for everybody, but I think for the people that are interested in it, that was definitely uh, a lot of interesting stuff. So I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your insights and experience. Oh, anytime. It was a, it was a blast. It was, it was not a boring conversation. It was, it was fun. Show notes, resources, links to the survival punk and links to things mentioned in this episode can be found at in the rabbit hole.com slash E one ninety six. Big Phil shared with you just some of the sexy, sexy benefits you get from becoming part of the I H roving horde armada. Find out what else you get by visiting itrh.net. And remember, members help the show stay safe and sound. That helps you stay safe and sound. Visit itrh.net and become a supporting member today. With that, we wrap up episode number 196 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. Westbrook.